hei mau i ora. Te whai au ki te ao mārama, tēnei, tēnei, te mau i, e kawe nei, tēnei kaupapa, karanga i te rangi nei, te pō nei. Nō rei rā, ko wai ho māku, te wā, te atimata tēnei o ngā wahanga, anō nei, ki tēnei o ngā kaupapa ko karanga hea, mo ko tanga roa, e ke pānuku, e ke takaroa, e ke pānuku, tā rewa tū ki te raki. Nō rei rā, te nā koutou. Aha, kia tīmata mai tātou ki tēnei o ngā karakea, kia wehi ai tātou ki tēnei o ngā kaupapa. Nō rei rā, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te toa, kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā taratara ki tae, e hii ake ana te ātātura, te tio, te huka, e hau hū, ti hei mau uri ora. So, it is my distinct pleasure and honour to tonight, just to open these proceedings and uh, to welcome you to this kaupapa that we've uh, that has been organised today or this evening, um, with the intent of sharing some of the things that we have going on in our little ecosystem here in Otaitahi. So, uh, without further ado, tēnā koutou. Tēnā koutou. Kia ora koutou, ko Stephen Tokuinga, nga o tatahi ao. Um, hi everyone, my name is Stephen Rowe, I'm going to be the MC for this evening, and I'll be introducing some people who are going to be sharing with us. I just have a question before we get underway. How many of you have a connection with the ocean? Yeah, I expect to see every hand up here, because don't we all have connections with the ocean, and particularly in a city like Christchurch? Um, it's my honour to welcome our mayor, Vianne Delzel. She's going to address us to begin. Um, and then we've got some other people who will be speaking. Thank you. E nga mana, e nga reo, e rau rangatira mā, tēnei te mihi ki a koutou, i te kōpapo, te rā, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā da tātou katoa. Good evening, everyone, and I wanted to I acknowledge a number of people who are here, but I think some people have been caught in traffic uh, and uh, may be joining us uh, as they can, and that would include the Honourable Eugenie Sage. Um, I don't think Diane Shang could be accused of being caught in traffic, but I think she'd um, be horrified if that was a suggestion. Um, but I know that she's hoping to join us tonight. Uh, I did want to acknowledge my fellow councillors, uh, uh, Pauline Cotter and Councillor Jimmy Chen, uh, it's really good that they have been able to come. Unfortunately, this clashes with the um, opening of Grow Ototahi, and so with that clash, I know that I should offer apologies uh, from the Chair of our Community Resilience and Sustainability um, Committee, uh, uh, Sarah Templeton, So, because uh, I know that she would otherwise be here. Um, and I, I do want to acknowledge um, Science Attaché Alessio um, Garino from the... Uh, uh, French Embassy, but I haven't met Alessio yet, so hi Alessio, hi. welcome, it's great that you're here. Um, so it really is a privilege to be able to welcome you here this evening and to thank James Nicotine and Blue Cradle for hosting this event, focusing our attention, our collective attention, on what is our ocean of opportunity. I looked at the Blue Cradle website and was inspired by what was described as a historic opportunity to invest in ocean science and research. Only then, it said, can we truly secure a safe and healthy future for the next generations. This is the beginning, 2021, the beginning of the UN decade of ocean science with its catchphrase, the ocean we need for the future we want. In the time we have tonight, we will be invited to think about all that we have at our doorstep. Otatahi Christchurch and Te Pātaka o Rakai Hautu Banks Peninsula are defined by the sea, our geography, as well as our maritime history, both pre- and post-European settlement. We are a port city with global sea connections and we are a gateway to the Southern Ocean and Antarctic uh, continent. The Whakaropo, Littleton and Akaroa harbours offer a safe haven and anchorage for ocean-going vessels, whether they are transporting goods, 
heading out to fish, bringing cruise passengers to visit us or supporting modern day explorers as they pass through. Our ocean and harbours provide aquatic ecosystems supporting numerous species endemic and migratory, common and endangered. The sea gives, us, gives those that call this place home opportunities to work and play as well as enjoy kaimoana. New Zealand's exclusive economic zone is the fifth largest in the world and about 15 times the size of our landmass. In 2017, the economic value of the Canterbury Blue Economy was calculated to be uh, $1.66 billion. I don't really need to remind anyone here that the ocean is of fundamental importance to this region and to New Zealand. I was really excited to be at the announcement that the first New Zealand Sail GP event will take place on Whakaropo, Littleton Harbour on January the 29th to 30th next year. Apart from the economic benefits, which will be enormous and a global audience of over 250 million viewers, the Grand Prix will boost our reputation as a coastal harbour city with incredible outdoor assets as well as the infrastructure and capability to hold major events. The Christchurch Sail GP event, though, will also raise awareness of conservation efforts related to Hector's dolphins, strengthen partnerships between all harbour users to work collectively on conservation and environmental protection, and promote environmental sustainability through sustainable event practices on and off the water. Sail GP embraces and leads the way with investment in clean energy technologies and will work on shared carbon reduction goals for the event and for the city. Sail GP uses the sporting platform to share a live ocean conservation message that will align the city strongly with the interests of the International Marine Protected Area Congress 2026, and that is the opportunity that Blue Cradle has seen for us to host the Congress here. We really support that as a result, so let's work together and make it happen. As a city, we are ready to take on the challenge that Blue Cradle is laying down for us, and that is a bigger role in addressing ocean health impact solutions through innovative partnerships, promoting scientific research, community-led conservation, and the regeneration of the seas in the context of challenging climate change and biodiversity crises. It is a big challenge, which is why we should explore the ocean we need for the future we want together. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā ratātou katoa. Thank you very much. That's great. And uh, there's a couple things that we're going to be doing um, this evening, and one of them is going to be having a panel, or well, two panels actually, and we're really keen to get your questions. So um, we're going to be circulating this piece of paper here. Um, and if you go to the website Slido, and there's a code called IMPACT6. Um, so I'll pass this around. I think there's another one as well. Um, if you go to that um, website, then you'll be able to actually enter in questions that you may have for any of the people who speak tonight. And you'll be able to, I think you can upvote them, right? You can kind of push the favorite ones up to the top, which will be really helpful. As, the, um, as we get to the end to be able to ask the questions that you all want to hear. Um, the other thing is um, the way this will work is after James speaks, we're gonna be hearing from the panelists and each of them are gonna be sharing something about who they are and what they do. And then we'll be having a break with some drinks and some networking and then coming back to have two panels. Um, so that's going to be the structure of the evening. So I'll just pass this over, if that's okay, and we can start um, moving that around. Um, I'm, I was really excited when James asked me to help out this evening because the reason I'm standing here is actually because of the ocean. My father uh, is a marine biologist, and so we moved to New Zealand from America back in the early 1980s, and he was brought in to help um, with some of the salmon industry setting up. So we actually first moved down to the Waitaki River and lived near there in a place called Papakayo, quite a small little place, blink and you miss it. Um, so for me, the ocean has always been a big part of my life because of my father's journey as a marine biologist. And my daughter is here today, she's 11 years old. And when I look at her, 
and I think of the legacy of my father and now my daughter here, and what the future holds for her and the generation that's coming, I have to ask some hard questions. So what we're gonna be doing is hearing from a number of different people um, their perspectives on the ocean and the opportunity that represents. But before we do that, I'm really excited to be able to welcome James Nicotine, who's the brains behind the scenes, who's put this all together from Blue Cradle. And I still remember the first time we met, I think originally it was with Edmund Hillary Fellowship, and then um, you had this idea of, I want to set something up. And we worked through it, and how would it look, what would it look like, and eventually it's become Blue Cradle. So um, it's a real privilege to welcome you to come up, James, and share with us um, a little bit of your journey and perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, Kerepeti. Thank you, Leanne. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, I think we're running a bit. There's a few slides missing that should have been there. Um, so, first of all, I would like to, yeah, thank you all for being here, for, for showing up. That's, that's really important. Um, um, I'd like to acknowledge the, the people um, on, on, you know, on whose soil we are now. So my, my pronunciation is, is uh, deplorable, but I will do my best. Naitwa um, Hu Ridi. Um, um, so I would uh, like to acknowledge um, that hapu and also the people of Naitahu uh, as a whole on which we stand, Te Waikunamu. Um, um, I think you say Tenakoto, Tenakoto, Tenakoto uh, Katoa. Um, so greetings, greetings to you all. Um, I think what connects us all indeed is the ocean, the ocean that we know so well that surrounds us, the 71%. Every breath we take, um, I mean, uh, you know, other people have said that, but it's true, half of the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean. Um, and so when I first moved here uh, in 2019, I, the, yeah, one of the first things I did is I went to the ocean, I went to the beach. I went to White Mary Beach. Uh, I always remember it with my three-year-old son. And I, and I immediately was drawn to the, the coast, um, which you know, one might argue that the South Island is more known for its mountains and, and rivers and lakes, but um, I went straight for the coast. And so then I discovered Te Pataka o Rakahatu and, and Fakaraupo and all those wonderful places over the last two years, and I met some incredible people. And so all this has nurtured my, my vision for Blue Gradle, and I will tell you a little bit about that. Uh, but first of all, you must be wondering, who's this guy? Um, well, I grew up on the shores of Lake Léman in France, so that's Geneva. Um, I'm French, British, and I was... Yeah, I grew up by lakes and mountains, so actually I was the furthest you could be from the sea which is quite strange, but it's, it's often the case that you're drawn to what you don't have. Um, I'm a graduate of Edinburgh, uh, Master's in Marine Systems and Policies, and I'm a science communicator and diver, and as Stephen said, I'm an Edmund Hillary Fellow, so I moved here in 20, late 2018 uh, with my family. I'm also the co-chair of the eu for ocean platform, which is an ocean literacy platform uh, set up by the EU Commission, so I do some late night calls with them. Which is, which is a lot of fun. Um, and I'm also a member of the World Commission on Protected Areas of IUCN since 2016. Um, and that's me there, uh, growing up, uh, diving in Corsica with my father. Um, so without further ado, I'll try and summarize Blue Cradle. What we try and do, is, so we're a non-profit, we're a charity, we established in June 2020. We try and make ocean science and marine conservation more accessible. We promote ocean science and conservation through ocean literacy, education, and te ao Maori. And we facilitate partnerships, events like this, and we build ocean experiences, and we make documentary films. So those are just a few examples of the activities that we're currently doing. Um, workshops, events, uh, documentaries, one of which is being screened tomorrow night at the Antarctic Center on penguins. Um, and so we very much, in, you know, in the middle, we, we see ourselves as facilitating partnerships between scientific organizations, institutions, nationally and internationally, and working very much uh, with community. Recently, we partnered with Pohatu Penguins, who are in the room, um, and Orbica, a GIS company from Christchurch, 
and we got some funding from ECAN and the Rata Foundation, and we worked on a GIS uh, survey uh, with over 60 volunteers. That's the documentary that we made with Kitapiti um, that will be screened tomorrow night. And so this is the 3D model of Banks Peninsula, Te Pataka, uh, with some burrows. So that data set will then help us uh, learn more about the marine environment. And so there's further work uh, to be done on these white flippered penguins which are native and they're the only endemic bird species of Canterbury, by the way, sure, plug. Um, so we've got three main programs. I won't dwell too much. All this is on the website. We've got an educational program, very much working with schools, universities. We're looking at doing some, some excursions with some young people. So we'll be fundraising for that as well, applying for grants. We've got a research program currently working with uh, ESR, Crown Research Institute, and also Cawthron on microplastics and biosecurity, and also a digital outreach program which is very much hand in hand with the rest of our work, so producing content to engage audiences. Um, this is very much at the heart of what we do, the ocean literacy principles. There are seven of them. I encourage you to go and read about them on the Ocean Decade website. Um, as Lianne said, we've, we've just started this decade long of the uh, ocean science for sustainable development. We shouldn't forget the sustainable development part. Billions of people depend on the ocean for their livelihoods, and it's about making sure that we have access to the data to then inform on the decisions that we make from disaster risk reduction to fisheries to coastal, uh, yeah, integrated coastal zone management, climate change, biodiversity, and so on. And so these seven principles, um, I won't read them out, but um, they're very important, it's essentially we are connected to the ocean, we are the ocean, and everything we do needs to be done in that uh, understanding on a permanent basis. And we need to invest so much more in science and exploration. Uh, the long-term dream is to acquire a platform like this. This is a ship uh, based in the UK called the Song of the Whale. Um, and they conduct acoustic research on marine mammals. They also deploy instruments. Uh, to learn about the acidity or the phytoplankton, zooplankton levels, and also microplastics. And so this is a sort of platform that I could see very useful for a place like Ototahi. Um, and so that's really the goal, is to have a permanent platform like this based here uh, to help solve, uh, uh, yeah, solve some challenges. Um, so what opportunity? In New Zealand, Aotearoa, we have this wonderful Te Ao Māori worldview, which I think is, is great because it just gives that... Um, place for nature back to, you know, off the, the Western model of consumption and capitalism. Let's re-embrace, you know, being in balance with nature. Um, and I think that's really something that Aotearoa needs to really embrace fully. Uh, we're in a city that's ma managed disaster risk wonderfully through community resilience. We're the second largest city in the country, with the third largest port, with one of the five gateways to Antarctica. We've got a marine mammal sanctuary right on our doorstep, two marine reserves. We've got an academic, great academic institutions. We've got CRIs here. We've got a vibrant tech and startup scene. And we've got a mountain to sea context, which is f fundamentally important when we're talking about ocean science. Um, so the opportunity is to look at the marine protected area network around the world. And currently, we only have 2.7% of global ocean protected. Those are the blue areas, the dark blue areas. And you can see where we are. We are right next to one of the largest in the world, the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. And to the north, we've got the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park, we've got Hawaii, we've got Pitcairn, we've got all these marine protected areas um, that have varying levels of protection, but they're really, um, you know, they represent communities, people, people in villages, managers. And so being a place to host a, an event like this just makes a lot of sense. The first impact was in Australia, in Victoria. So it went to the US, then it went to Marseille, then it went to La Serena in Chile where I went, and next year it'll be in Vancouver. So I'm, I'm hopeful that we can line up our ducks, and I've put a few logos there with question marks, but who will join the Impact 6 bid? Um, I leave that to you. And so right now we're gonna engage in a dialogue, a discussion which I hope will form the the, the beginning of this conversation around marine protection and also the future of, um, of life on Earth. Uh, you know, ultimately, it's about that. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, 
questions. So now this is going to be quite exciting because there's going to be a couple minutes for different people to share some perspectives. And this is going to be like a fire hose of information. So get ready. Um, first up, we've got Professor Karen Scott. Do you mind coming on up? And um, thank you very much, uh, James, for your generous invitation um, to speak at this event. And um, it's a great privilege to do so. And um, thank you, everyone, for uh, coming. And it's wonderful to be part of such a, a panel of speakers tonight. So James asked me to talk about um, the global regime with a particular emphasis on marine protected areas and really to think about the connections um, between the, the global and the local. Um, and just as in terms of about me, I'm from the law school, as um, was said, and uh, my particular area is international law. I have a passion for law of the sea, and in particular uh, marine environmental protection, and also an interest in the uh, polar regions. So thinking about sort of the connections between sort of the local and the global, um, I think scientists, and I think probably us as individuals, instinctively know that the oceans are connected um, from an ecological perspective, whether that's through currents, wind, um, species, etc. But as lawyers, we tend to draw boundaries. Um, and those boundaries aren't necessarily coterminous with um, ecosystems. And of course, when, once you start to draw boundaries, you also then create gaps. So there's often a disconnect um, between a highly integrated and connected ocean um, and the various regimes we have um, designed to manage that ocean. So I want to talk a little bit about that tonight. And in actual fact, last week we had a really neat example, which I'm sure many of you saw, it was quite widely reported, um, of the local and the global connection. So this is actually a piece of research with a number of New Zealand authors, um, quite widely reported, and it was looking at seabirds, and in particular the importance of the high seas as providing habitats for seabirds, um, as well as, of course, um, areas under the jurisdiction of states. And the article was actually quite critical of the high seas protective regime with respect to seabirds and made the really important point that it didn't really matter how well you protect seabirds within your national jurisdiction if they are inappropriately protected on the high seas. You have to have um, a comprehensive and integrated regime. So really kind of demonstrating the connection between the global um, and the local here. So in terms of the global regime, and um, this is a slide I show my students, and I'm not going to talk about each bubble, but I really use it to demonstrate the complexity of the global regime. So we don't have one overarching institution or regime which manages the oceans. We actually have a multiple range of institutions and regimes. And they apply in relation to particular geographic areas or particular issues such as fishing or shipping. Um, many of the measures that they promulgate are mutually supportive, some duplicate efforts, and of course we have some which simply contradict one another. So it's actually quite a complex um, a range of institutions and regimes to try to engage with at the international level. So to perhaps simplify it a little bit, to focus in on the issue which I know James is particularly interested in, um, and that's marine protected areas. So I thought I'd just say a few words about sort of the global regime with respect to marine protected areas. So I guess the overarching instrument would be the primary um, legal regime for the law of the sea, and that's the 1982 United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, or UNCLOS. You'll find that law of the sea uh, in specialists very much like their acronyms. We have one for almost everything. So this is uh, often described as the constitution for the ocean. So it was adopted in 1982. New Zealand's a party. Most states are. 164 states are. And it's really designed to set out the entire sort of basic regime, basic principles applying to all activities. And that sets out a general obligation about protecting the marine environment. All states have an obligation to do so, and in particular protecting vulnerable ecosystems. So it provides a, a platform, if you like, or a legal basis for area-based protection. The Biodiversity Convention, adopted in 1992, um, another acronym there, the CBD, um, is also a general framework convention with respect to MPAs, providing for a general uh, obligation. 
And that actually has um, developed a number of initiatives whereby it's developed guidelines for identifying suitable areas for protection. To add to this, we have a number of soft targets, and perhaps the most well-known at the moment is SDG, or Sustainable Development Goal 14.5. And of course, the aim there was to protect 10% of the marine environment by 2020. Well, the best figure is uh, about just over 7%. Um, if you take a much stricter approach um, to MPAs, then as James indicated, it rather comes down. So we'd rather miss that target. We also then have regimes which actually implement marine protected areas, and they tend to be either fisheries, so regional fisheries organisations, um, or regional seas organisations, or of course states within their own uh, jurisdiction. And then a really exciting development at the moment, which is under negotiation, is a new global treaty, which New Zealand is highly involved in, um, designed to protect biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. And that currently is under negotiation um, at the United Nations and is going to have a big focus on marine protected areas. Um, at the moment, negotiations are going quite slowly, um, of course, owing to the COVID crisis. So just really finishing off, um, with some thoughts about what can New Zealand do to engage in this process and perhaps really, you know, to put itself in a really good position to get the um, MPA Congress in 2026. Well, one thing we can think about locally is actually developing a modern MPA policy, which we really don't have. We actually protect around 0.4% of our exclusive economic zone, and that is well below the national average, which is about 17%. So that's something we're actually doing pretty poorly on. Um, the latest target, which isn't an official target, but may well become so, is to try to protect 30% of marine environment by 2030. We can continue to do what we're already doing, which is actually making major contributions at the regional level and the international level for these global legal frameworks. And actually, this is something that New Zealand does really well. It's highly engaged in terms of international policy. But one of the things it needs to do is to bring that policy back home in order to bring that best practice back home in terms of its own marine management. So really connecting that global with the local. So thank you very much. Kia ora. That was great, and someone who does quite a lot in the bar, I really appreciate how you made that accessible for all of us, so thank you. That was really excellent. Um, I'd like you to just look around and, and think, uh, if you didn't know somebody here, and you had to summarize the one question you had from that presentation, what, what would it be? I'm not going to ask you to actually say it out loud, I just want to get you in the mindset of thinking here, because if you look at the bottom right corner of that slide, remember I was saying before about Slido and the fact that you can ask questions? Well, this is your chance. So if you go to that website and enter that code, you'll be able to enter in questions. So I just want to challenge you, as we're working through each of the speakers, be thinking, what is the question that I've got for this person? And then remember, we can collectively upvote them and um, see what emerges. But next up, um, we have Dr. Olga Patos. Thank you. Hi, so I didn't know I'd have that slide, you know, I'm not from Rampart. I'm a senior scientist at ESR based here in Christchurch. And I'm a marine biologist and um <coughs> oh, got the slide, got that. Um and I always love the sea. Um this is me on the sea in Greece. All of my summer holidays growing up were spent in Greece. And if I went missing, I was in the sea. Oh, I'm standing too far away, sorry. <laughs> it's a bit my face. Um, yeah, I spent all of my days in the sea, looking around, investigating. And because we went back successively year on year, I'd see the changes, the increase in plastic, the loss of seagrasses in the area, because I always had my same spots that I'd go back to. So from about six, I knew I was a bee marine biologist. And to do that, I needed to go to university. I did my degree in marine and environmental biology at St. Andrews University, and then went on to do a PhD looking at um, corals and the impact of human uh, activities on, hum uh, on the corals. So following that, I went on to do a postdoc in San Diego for two years, and then moved to Brisbane, to the University of Queensland, where I was there for 10 years, until just over five years ago, I came here. Distinct lack of, lack of corals, um, so slight change in what I was going to do, but you know, 
my heart is with the sea and that's I want to learn more and protect it and protect it for my daughter who also has the same passion. So um, about two or well, three years ago, two and a half years ago, um, I was lucky enough to work with a fantastic team and we got funding for a five year project looking at the impacts of microplastics on our terrain. So we have three main objectives with this project. We want to learn what the levels of microplastics are in New Zealand. And this includes the marine environment, so um, the water, the sediment, and the organisms, the fresh water, um, sediment, and water, and then also terrestrial soils, because of course what's in those soils eventually can end up in the marine system. Um, we want to understand those impacts. So the impacts of microplastics, it's most commonly thought of the toxic impacts on, on the environment. But there are other impacts, like for the marine biosecurity, plastics act as really wonderful vectors for invasive species and pathogens. Unlike natural materials, they can just keep on going and they can pass these boundaries that other um, materials might not um, be able to. Um, so we're looking at that, looking at how they can affect the microbial communities. You know, the microbes drive our environments. Um, so if you've got this different material there, is that affecting the biogeochemical um, processes that are occurring? And like James mentioned, half of our oxygen is coming from the oceans. And they're seeing already that some of these key species that produce our oxygen are being affected by the plastics in the oceans. And we also want to explore the solutions. Um, so not just we need to stop putting the plastics out, but are there other ways that we can look to solve this solution? So just some of the examples where we're looking, um, we're doing a range of surveys of sediment, um, beach sediments to look at the plastics in the beaches. We're doing surface water trawls and looking in um, green lip mussel is our main species of interest for the marine system. One of the impacts um, in the sea with the biodiversity, we have these wonderful um, experiments we've had out. We actually collected our one year final sample on Tuesday and we've um, been very lucky to have this hosted at the port in Littleton. And then looking at the microbial communi communities to see if there's anything that's living on there that is able to degrade the plastics and also looking at human behaviour, so both ends of the spectrum to see how we can help solve this really major um, problem we have with our oceans and plastics. So, you know, my, my real aim here is to improve our knowledge of the problems and the solutions and help to uh, support the change that we need going forward um, with this really big problem that we have. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And I love the um, emphasis there on what can we do differently? How can we be positive and, and change things? Um, remember in the bottom right, there's that Slido thing again. Is there a question that sticks out to you about microplastics that you really want to ask? Now's your chance. Um, Kiripiti Parone, thank you for coming up. Um, we were having a chat before we started about Rapaki Marai and the beautiful place that it is. If you haven't been there, you should definitely go and check it out. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what you have to share with us. Thank you. Katira tēnā tātou. Ka huri taku aro ki taku maunga te poho tamatea e re whakararo te awa o maru tai rawa mai ki taku moana ko whakaraupo. Tēnei au e mihi ana mai taku pātū wata wata a te rāwhaki o te raki whakaputa, tēnā tātou katoa, ko Kerepiti Paraone ahau. So, um, first of all, my name is Kerepiti, and um, I feel a little bit like a, like a poser tonight. Um, I, w I wasn't sure how I was going to present, and I had all of these things written down, and I rewrote them in like a hundred million times, and then I threw them all out this morning. So, uh, here we are today. Um, so, first of all, um, thank you, uh, James, for inviting me to be part of this panel and to share a little bit of um, the perspective that I'm going to bring today, which is um, from a hapu and um, whānau based um, uh, worldview. And so this first image is a portrayal of what's important to me, 
and that is my home and all the things that uh, tie it together. So this, this image here you'll find in the side, the back uh, wall of my whare in Rāpaki. And so at the top we have a guy called Rākai Hotu. And why he's important to the story is that he ties in all of our navigational stories that bring Māori to Aotearoa. And so for us here down in um, the south, he is one of the ancestors, much like Māori, to have discovered this area. So between 800 and 1,000 years ago, he turned up in what is now known as um, Shag Rock. So the old, used to be a thing of rock standing there. And so he represents all of the things and all of the expertise that it took to get here. And with him, he also is, is, is acknowledged for having discovered the place that we're from, Te Pātaka o Rākaihotu, otherwise known as Banks Peninsula. And through that, he discovered this place was an absolute beautiful, absolutely beautiful area. And not only that, it was full of food. It was like pack and save. <laughs> and so he called it Te Pātaka o Rākaihotu. And so, leading on from there, part of our creation story going right back to the gods, says that Tangaroa, what, Rangi and Papa, before they got married, there was actually a little bit of adultery going on. So uh, Rangi also had a previous wife and Papa had a previous husband. And so Papa's previous husband in our story is Tangaroa. So in that story, it tells a relationship between the land and the sea. And so the full perspective of the way we see the, the world is that one cannot exist without the other. Hey, they have a relationship that is time proven. Oh, jumping back. Now coming down into context of what we're talking about here in terms of the ocean and how we see it and how we manage the world that we are in today. Because obviously there's exponential amounts of, of history that comes with this knowledge. But it's very hard to, to make that cross over into today's world. However, we're sitting in, um, in a space where we have the opportunity to take these lessons that we've already been through, our people have already seen, and bring them into this day and age, which I would define as something along the lines of tikanga-based design thinking. And that means that we take the best of both worlds. We look at what we can do in this day and age with the technology that we have, but we also look at the examples of how we can best operate in those systems, maintaining the equilibrium or balance that we have between land and sea. And so that's basically the point I want to make today. I had a lot of other things, but um, that's where I'm going to end it. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you so much, Kiribiti. That was really excellent. Thank you. And it just gives a grounding to what we're talking about here as well. So thank you very much. Next up, we've got Kipros Kotsikas. You, would you be able to come and share with us? That would be great. Thank you. Kalispera. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the invitation to talk today, uh, probably the outside of the discussion. My name is Kipros Kotsikas. I'm the owner of United Fisheries. I came to New Zealand as an 80-year-old kid or a boy in 1962. And I worked with my brother in the Fisher chip shop. 60 years later, I'm still playing with the fish. <laughs> What I learned over my business career, selling fish, processing fish, visiting fish factories, and talking to people, I came to the conclusion, and I said that 20 years ago, that is more money in the byproducts of the fish than in the fillets. And I was too busy marketing fish, look after the business, 
And it wasn't until I retired, which was some 15 years ago, that I decided to put my money where my beliefs were. So I designed a special plan to use all the offer from the processing factory. And we produce it, two products. It's the name of the product is Power Marines. It's an enzymatically hydrolyzed fish. And we produce two products, silage to feed the animals, and fertilizer to feed the land. We engage Lekka University, Professor Jim Gibbs, he does the research, and we know that we can reduce the method emission from the cows by 33% if we feed the animals with the fish, fish salad. We can reduce the worms in the calves by 66%, and we can increase the omega-3 fish, I mean the omega-3 in the milk by tenfold, the same with the meat. The fish liquid fertilizer that we promote, it is the best fertilizer you have ever been made. Talking about byproducts, as our process and our fish that we use is a wild fish, no hormones and no antibiotics. We produce the byproduct from the fertilizer is the fish bone. So we produce a fish bone powder, which is good. From what I know, it's one of the few calciums that the body can absorb. Our next project is to produce from the skins, fish oil, and collagen. The fish liquid fertilizer enhances the biology in the soil. It creates the depth and the health of the soil. Healthy soils, healthy plants, healthy animals. And by enhancing the soil, you're getting a deeper and healthier soil. By having deeper soil, you got deeper roots, you will absorb the water, so you will need less irrigation. That's one of the problems we've got. And also, it will be less nutrients reaching into the rivers, the lakes, and the sea. Less chemical fertilizers, more natural fertilizers, and compost. Again, we produce the healthy soil. Less leaching of chemicals into our rivers, the lakes, and the sea. Crystal clear waters of New Zealand. That was the logo. That's, a, that's what I was selling for something like 40 years, 50 years. Everywhere I went, I was selling my fish. I was proud to say that the fish that I was selling, it came out of the crystal clear waters of New Zealand. I'm not sure if I can say that today. But I know that we can get back to that crystal clear waters again by using less chemicals and use natural fertilizers. And what we have to sell to the farmers, but we need scientific research and we need a lot of money. And I was, I was told, why don't you do the research? To do that research, it would take 10 years. I'm 77 years old, so by the time they finish the research, I probably won't be here. So I believe that money for that research should come from the government. The 
by increasing the depth of the soil and keep a filling with natural products, you get a much healthier grass, full of nutrients, nutrients that the animal doesn't need to eat as much. So if you know the urine from the animal, it be less, and of course, what it was in the rivers, it would be less again. One of the things that you don't get many people to talk about is the carpal sinking. If we increase the depth of the soil just a little bit every year, and we sink the, the roots of the plants that get bigger, the amount of carbon you will sink is incredible. The edge tree, be, I believe it be less than what we are producing. On that note, I thank you. I'm sorry if I talk away from the, what the subject is, but I'll be happy to answer any questions later. That was great, and it's just good to hear so many different perspectives. And I love the quote on one of your slides there, that first one. And it, it ties in, um, that one was talking about grandchildren and grandparents and, and legacy. And for me, um, there's a similar quote, which I really love, which is, are we planting seeds of trees that we'll never sit in the shade of? And it really comes back to this concept of stewardship. And I think in Tao Maori, the, the word is kaitiakitanga. Know, looking for the next generation. How are we holding things lightly so that it's held and ready to pass on rather than consuming it now? Next up, we have Anita Spencer. Thank you. very much for the invitation to um, speak to you today. Um, I'm a biodiversity ranger in our local Department of Conservation office uh, in the Mahanui district. Uh, our office is based in Sockburn and we're a very coastal office. Um, we, our district covers from the Rakai River in the south uh, north to the Conway River, um, close to Kaikoura, uh, and includes Banks Peninsula. Uh, we've got a field base at Devosho on Banks Peninsula, um, where we have three staff, including a marine ranger. Um, and as um, Professor Scott has explained, there's a, a lot of legislation um, within the um, marine environment um, in New Zealand. These are some of the acts that the department works under. Some of these are ones that we administer, like the Marine Reserves Act or the Wildlife Act, um, and others are just ones that we have uh, responsibilities under. Um, and uh, there are uh, several overlapping jurisdictions which can um, sometimes be reasonably confusing. Um, so the work that we do, um, we do have um, science and technical expertise and we're always uh, looking to improve our knowledge um, and integrate Mataranga Māori. Um, we do uh, compliance and law enforcement within the marine environment. Um, so locally that means uh, at Devashel we um, have a, a boat and we're doing regular marine patrols um, uh, protecting them, two marine reserves, uh, one in Aukara Harbour and the next one around the corner at Pohatu. Um, we also um, uh, monitor tourism operators that have um, concessions for um, watching marine mammals and uh, we talk to recreational boat owners um, making sure they understand the behaviour that's needed to protect our marine mammals, particularly hectares, dolphins. Um, we do a lot of other activities, um, uh, including uh, working with national policy and legislation in writing that. Um, so in 2020, just last year, um, the Te Mana o Te Tayo was released, the New Zealand Biodiversity Strategy. And as part of that, um, in tandem was also released a sort of a state of the nation um, overview of uh, how are our threatened species doing. Uh, and this is the um, summary of our marine species. Um, 
So we have different uh, layers of threat rankings uh, in the grey um, is ones that are data deficient. So there was a summary for our marine species, you can see 47% of our marine species, we don't actually have enough data to be able to say what is their status. Um, are they stable, increasing, decreasing? Um, it's just don't have that information available. 4% uh, of them are threatened, uh, which means that they're um, uh, on the uh, slide to extinction unless conservation management um, actions are taken. Uh, and then uh, in the yellow, at risk, um, which means that uh, they're um, uh, at the moment, um, the population may be stable, it may have um, a long-term decline, but basically they're an event away from um, what could be um, becoming threatened. Uh, and only 17% of our marine species are regarded as not threatened. So some taxa uh, within the marine environment are more threatened than others, seabirds in particular, one in three of them is threatened. Uh, and that's for a variety of reasons. Um, the Antipodean albatross, where the main causes are fisheries bycatch and, um, and climate change, um, through to some of the species that breed on the New Zealand mainland, such as fairy terns, hut and shearwaters, uh, where different issues with um, habitat destruction, um, predation by um, introduced mammals. And then, believe it or not, um, for two out of two out of three of our marine mammals, uh, they're regarded as data deficient, so we don't have that information. Uh, and that's particularly for the species that are totally marine um, and don't come onto the land. Uh, there's a lot of pressures on the marine environment. Um, this is just a summary diagram of um, some of the key ones. Uh, it's everything from introduced invasive species, uh, so species like Undaria, which smothers marine habitats, changes in the land and sea use, so increasing sedimentation of our estuaries and coastal waters, direct exploitation, pollution and climate change. So some of the uh, outcomes that were set in Tamana or Tataro um, were 2050 goals, and so you can see these here. Um, I'm hopeful we can reach uh, some of these well before 2050. Um, and I think events like this um, helped put us on track to do that. So the different types of marine protection that we have in New Zealand include uh, marine reserves, which is that top tier of protection. Um, so these are no-take reserves, um, and uh, we have 44 of them, um, and they make up 9.8% of our uh, territorial seas, um, but only 0.4% of our EEZ. Um, then there's the second tier of protection, marine protected areas, um, and that includes uh, places where there's um, a tai tai in place or um, some others such as uh, zones to protect um, underwater infrastructure like the cable protection zones across Cook Strait. Um, but um, with a, a national and international goal of having 10% of our waters protected, um, we've still got a fair way to go. There's other spatial protections, so marine mammal sanctuaries. So last year, um, these were extended. Uh, the one on Banks Peninsula, uh, you can see there, um, it's now up to 20 nautical miles, um, which was increased from four nautical miles, and it goes further north and south. Um, and then there's, uh, in brown, are the benthic protected areas, so those are no trawl zones. And in the green are uh, sea mount protected areas where there's no trawling within the entire water column. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you very much. And it was interesting, on one of those slides, wasn't it, talking about what will it be like in 2050? Um, you know, just that perspective. What are we moving towards? Tenakoto katoa. Ko Kim Kelleher Aho. I'm going to talk very briefly about Littleton Port's role in the blue economy and highlight our sustainability ambitions with the intention of sparking some contacts um, today. Uh, it's an amazing audience and I've already had some great conversations, so my intention is to hopefully spark some ideas about how we can work together to assist us to reach our biodiversity ambition, which will naturally contribute um, to New Zealand's overall. 
It's our reality that we're facing significant challenges, especially with climate change adaptation and mitigation and biodiversity loss. But there is also significant opportunities and the way to uncover and leverage those will be through collaborations. In this brief talk, I also hope to highlight what we have to share with others and hopefully what we would also like to create together, which is biodiversity positive future where a prosperous and profitable port contributes to Whakarapo to Littleton Harbour as a thriving marine ecosystem. A little bit about the port. If your day started today with a coffee, like most people's, um, or maybe it was tying the kids' shoelaces, or maybe you rode your bike here, um, or called home on your cell phone before this event, then chances are all those things were made possible in some way by imports coming over the wharves at Littleton Port. To give you a sense of the value created by the port, last year the port facilitated the movement of about $6 billion in worth of exports, and close to $4 billion in terms of imports. We have over 600 people working with us directly, but many, many thousands more enabled by the economic activity of the port. In terms of shipping lines, um, we have about 94 international ports connected to us and about 39 countries included there. The port's a major part of the blue economy connecting Autotahi Christchurch to the world. We've set ourselves a really ambitious goal of being a company that's biodiversity positive, which means having, ultimately, a net positive effect on nature in terms of our harbour environment. We're working to bring nature into the business and into the boardroom, so it's recognised as a capital that adds value to the business and underpins our business, no longer an externality, which was the case in the past. We know that this is ambitious and we know that we can't do it alone and we know that we don't have all the answers to this, but this is part of the reason why I'm here today. We'll be tracking our progress and measuring these interactions, both positive and negative, in the context of aiming to reach this biodiversity positive outcome. We'll be actioning this in a couple of ways, um, turning down the dial on the things which are having the negative impacts and turning up the dial on the actions which can create measurable enhancement outcomes. Why? Well, if biodiversity is in crisis, and it is, then our human health, our livelihoods, including our economy, are also at risk. As a foundation of this ambition, it's important we understand the state of play. So over the past eight years or so, we've invested significantly in understanding the state of Whakarapo of Littleton Harbour through all sorts of methods, such as extensive diver ecological surveys combined with real-time water quality information. The port can play a role in enabling others, others on this journey as well by sharing an enormous range of data and knowledge that we have across all of these areas. Everything from hydrodynamics to wildlife to um, everything in between, really. I hope that this stimulates some connections for people and some ideas about ways that we might be able to assist and work together. We would love for this information to be used further and, and for this knowledge to be built on. So if any of this is in interest, then please get in touch with me. This knowledge has been built through science, but com if combined with Mātauranga Māori, then this will enable us to realise these future opportunities for a sustainable ocean environment. To put a practical lens on this, this is Mary Jane. She's a highly skilled marine mammal observer from a company called Blue Planet Marine, who oversaw the construction of the Littleton Cruise Wharf. As an example of working with nature and what that can mean, the wharf was specifically designed with the protection of Hector's dolphins in mind, down to the level of the number and diameter of the piles that were used. Dolphins, if detected in the zone um, around the work site, Mary Jane gave the signal and the whole job site was shut down until the animals moved away of their own accord. We're in their environment and this is part of what working with nature means. Kuta Katai, the mountains to the sea. Finally, we're, we know that partnerships are really key and we're really keen to hear from others and connect, as I've said, heading in the same directions towards a healthy, thriving ocean environment for Whakarapo and also a healthy and thriving port for Ōtutahi. We already have one such partnership in place, the Foka Ora partnership with Mana Whenua to Hapua Nga and, and the councils. The kaupapa and purpose of that plan is to restore the ecological and cultural health of, of Whakarapo. We would love to build on that with further collaborations around a thriving harbour environment and port. 
So please, if this knowledge and science that we can share is useful for you or you're interested in collaborating, then um, I would love to, to speak with you more. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was really interested in some of these slides, actually, because this one here is an interesting perspective there. You know, look at how it's taken with the ocean. And we heard before that 70% of the Earth is ocean. Like, what if our photos actually reflected the amount of ocean and water? I thought that one was really interesting. And then this one here, um, yeah, look at that perspective, you know, looking out and seeing the ocean and then seeing the city and then off into the mountains. Just good um, reminders, I thought. Um, next up, and second to last speaker, we have Jack Holloway. Tinakoto Katoa, good evening. I'm Jack Holloway, and I am a co founder and director of Kelpin Limited, which is that slide. Kelpin is a company which is harnessing the potential of seaweed to create truly compostable alternatives to single-use plastics. In terms of our relevance to Sea Week, long term we're aiming to use seaweed which is farmed here in New Zealand. So a bit of background on us. We started off in 2019 with a competition at University of Canterbury's Centre for Entrepreneurship. Uh, since then, like all startups, it hasn't been a really straight path, but um, as it stands at the moment, we've orientated ourselves towards being a business-to-business -business company, and we're currently in talks with a number of business customers about niches and what places where our particular plastic product can be valuable to them. Um, our latest big piece of sort of exciting news is we've recently got a bit of R&D funding through a grant, so we're going to be looking to expand our WE team in the near future. So if there's any um, Postgrads with sort of chemical, chemistry, chemical engineering, bioplastic backgrounds out there, come and have a chat to me or one of the team afterwards. So I've got a wee bit of a rant to have about bioplastics, so bear with me. Two years ago, before we started Kelpin, if somebody asked me to define what a bioplastic is, I probably would have suggested criteria along the lines of something that's biodegradable, something that's based on renewable materials, and I probably would have been wrong. So in New Zealand, it's, it's pretty loose what you can call a bioplastic at present. So on this slide here, where it says bio-based, that's just as opposed to fossil-based. So any sort of renewable plant cellulose, for example, is quite a common um, bioplastic, bio-based material. But so in the top right there, biodegradable and bio-based, yeah, that sounds about right. That's probably roughly in line with what I would have thought a bioplastic should be. But non-biodegradable and bio-based, wee bit iffy, don't know how I feel about that. Or biodegradable and fossil-based, again, seems like we're sort of stretching the definitions of what a bioplastic should be, right? And even then, that one, biodegradable and bio-based, it seems to be in the sweet spot. But even those biodegradable plastics, unless they find their way to a commercial composting facility at the end of their useful life, they can take just as long to break down as conventional plastic. So if they're in a landfill, they're blowing around a paddock, if they're floating around in the ocean, they can do just as much damage. Now the reason I go to the links to explain this is to emphasize what it is that we are doing. Kelvin harnesses the potential of seaweed to create truly compostable alternatives single-use plastics. So with our product, you can throw it in your garden and it will be halfway gone in five days. What we're doing is very, very different to what's currently being done in the plastics industry. On the note of our plastic itself, it's, it's essentially a soft plastic, so it's flexible, it's durable, it's transparent, it's odourless, you can put it in a freezer, and in a home composting situation it will be completely gone in 30 days. Uh, so before I mention five days halfway gone, that's, that's kind of what that looks like. So as you can see, that's literally just sitting in a garden and not a huge amount of it left after five days. 
So at the core of it, for me, kelpin is about two things. We're plastic and we're seaweed. And out of those two, plastic is actually the one which links us the most closely to the sea, I think. It's the one that we started with. And it links us closely to the sea because it's an unfortunate fact in the world that we live in that a lot of single-use plastic ends up in the sea. But if we can solve, or if we can be a tiny part of the solution to that single-use plastic crisis, then we can do something which is not only beneficial for the environment, but also beneficial for us. And that is one of the real core drivers of who we are trying to be as a company. And of course, alongside that, there is the seaweed. So very shortly after we naively decided to tackle the plastic problem, we literally thought, seeing as it's the ocean, which is bearing the brunt of the consequences here, why don't we look to the ocean for a solution? And that led us quite quickly to using seaweed as our raw material. And there's so many benefits to using farmed seaweed. I mean, it is so many benefits. It is a uh, really good, as, as we've heard earlier on tonight from United Fisheries, it's a really good carbon sequestration tool. It's really good at cleaning coastal waters. It creates habitat for other marine species. And it potentially could be a really, really valuable industry for New Zealand as well. So to sum it up, we're a plastic company which has turned to the ocean for a solution. We see a future in which New Zealand is a global leader in seaweed aquaculture and therefore also a global leader in helping to solve the single-use plastic crisis. Um, if you want to hear some more, either get in touch with us at that email or come and have a chat to Abel or myself afterwards. Cheers. That's great. Thank you so much. I remember being at UCE when they presented now um, about a year and a half ago, two years ago, so it's great to see. Isn't it cool how Christchurch has young innovators coming up and doing some really cool, inventive stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. I think it's really amazing. And um, it's great to see an example like that. So thank you for sharing. Um, our final speaker for this part of the evening um, is Todd Schmidt. you want to come on up? Thank you. I'm glad I'm wearing something different tonight. To, um, kia ora koutou. Um, very interesting to see all the perspectives and obviously I'm going to give one on the tourism uh, industry and uh, also when you look at an image like that it's a whole different perspective. The ocean is uh, presently protecting us I believe from all the uh, international uh, tourists and um, protecting us in the lights of COVID but it's also connecting us and uh, as you can see from these uh, penguins down in Antarctica the uh, the comparisons that we're talking about tonight, how the ocean pulls us together, it's the food source for these penguins, it's also a food source for us. But what I'm excited to do is to represent the tourism industry and obviously I'll talk a little bit about the International Antarctic Centre while we do that. But our first first off, I'm just it is a 101 on the tourism industry. On our back doorstep we've got Fahatu penguins and they are incredible in, in advocating the protection and the conservation of the um, korororo um, little blues and, and our white flipper. And uh, just on the back doorstep also, we've got Paul and his team at uh, Black Cat Cruises. And uh, we've heard about it a number of times tonight around the Akara Marine Reserve and what they're doing for the uh, Hector Dolphins and the protection of. And just up the road in Kaikoura, obviously, we've got Kaikoura Whale Watch. And their work is incredible, the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary, you know, and anti-whaling mess messaging and their uh, advocacy and promotion around that. So these are, I'm going to go through a few more, these are um, examples just on our back doorstep. As domestic tourists, your job over the next coming months is to go and support them and understand how this message comes through and what their role is. Just one personal experience I have with Wales and it takes me back to when I was travelling through Cambodia and I was very naive at the time driving down these freshly created highways and seeing on the sides of the roads big plaques saying this road was gifted and donated by 
government of, of a certain country. And I was naive at the time, but those millions and millions of dollars to build the roads were equivalent to a vote on the Whaling Council, right? So, um, yeah, this is the messaging that contradicts all of that behaviour. Also down in Dunedin, we've got the Royal Albatross Colony. Um, again, they connect with the Otago University around scientific research. A lot of you in the room will know more than me about a lot of this stuff. But obviously around protecting and preserving the, uh, the natural environment down there. An interesting one for us, because we approach it in a whole different way at the International Antarctic Centre, is Omaru penguins. Protection, again, and research. Now, there's, you may look at this picture and think, well, that's an artificial uh, infrastructure in place there. Well, it actually serves a great purpose because if that wasn't there, then the disruption to these penguins would be significant and they wouldn't be in that habitat. So there is a benefit of, uh, of infrastructure in, in telling the story. Down near Stewart Island, this is on hold, obviously. The um, power fishermen weren't uh, too happy with the increased attention of sharks in their waters. But... Um, yeah, another way of promoting the marine environment. And just lastly, up in um, Picton, there's beachcombers, which they do a lot around the, um, the eco-tourism and connecting the, the natural environment on land to the water, and they do that through all of their tours. So there's a lot of examples here in the South Island and across New Zealand around where tourism fits in our role. And I just want to talk about that a little more the role of tourism organisations as we see it. So, obviously ocean literacy, it's a common term we have these days, and um, how we can really support um, the work of scientists and the work of, of non-profits like James, is we have a wider, a wider reach, okay? So, the scientific information is incredible, the work that the scientists are doing. Our job is to decipher that and get it to the masses. So we create more advocates and more ambassadors for, our, for our environmental and, and ocean protection. Um, obviously, we have a whole different range of learning styles, whether it's immersive, whether it's hands-on, but we know the new generation are more, um, I guess, connected with technology, and that's how we need to get these messages across. Um, secondly, around citizen science, touched on again, and... You know, there's a growing trend in travel, and, and that's why I think these tourism organisations that are more than recreational and pro provide the thrill will have, a, have more of a sustainable future because we're giving back and there's people travelling around the world, whether it's through voluntary tourism or whether it's just looking for a, an experience around citizen science so they can contribute. And, um, yeah, that's obviously where tourism and businesses are trying to diversify and grab a new market and use tourists to give back to our own natural environment. Um, lastly, up in the centre there, cause learning. It's a new term that we've pulled into the tourism story and we want to subtly do this. We, we're not out there to, um, to be activists in any way. We believe through cause learning we can make a huge difference to a very wide demographic, whether they're locals or international, young children, and um, obviously the elderly. So just quickly, I want to talk to you about the International Antarctic Centre and what we do. We've got uh, Penguin Rescue, and uh, at the moment we've got 18 little blues and white flippids that wouldn't survive in the wild. So we uh, care for them and protect and we use them to tell our message and connect it back to ocean literacy. Obviously with DOC and the concessions and the Zoo and Aquarium Association is a really important organisation that ensures that whether it's aquariums and zoos all across Australasia tell, us, tell a connected story and we're all working together. So that's our, um, our penguin rescue. And then the other exciting part of what we do at the International Antarctic Centre is with the uh, Antarctic Academy. We have Miranda Satisfate here, who's our director. And it's um, pulling the SDGs through into our curriculum. Obviously, um, we've got the Life Below Water Climate Action because Antarctica and um, Michelle and co over here from Gateway Antarctica truly understand the work that they're doing as scientists down in Antarctica um, helps us understand and educate to the, to the youth around you know, how important Antarctica is and, and how it is the barometer. Um, and obviously, while we're all in this room, 
partnership. So we're only as strong and, and um, yeah, I guess future focused as we are collectively as organisations across all these sectors, whether it's in education or private. And I've got four um, partners that I just want to touch on because Science Alive Mataranga is doing virtual learning programs with us and that's obviously got a, a wider reach. We've got the Squawk Squad, which are um, more of an online learning platform, and they've recreated the way that we connect with schools. Okay, and they do that nationally. Gateway Antarctica, who I just referred to, um, they've come in and they've taken over the IAC for a day. They've had all their grad students actually on the floor talking to the visitors that come through. And Antarctica New Zealand, obviously really important for us around the education forums that they run and we connect through those. So we're very fortunate to have a really strong stakeholder and partnership model, and that helps us deliver through the academy. And um, where to from here is the big question. So obviously James asked, asked us to refer to what can we all do? And from our perspective, lightheartedly, in fact, uh, six in uh, 2026, you can bring tourists back to Christchurch, Otatahi would be fantastic. But um, now, on a more serious note around that, um, yeah, it's just understanding how we can all work together because we are the shop front window at the International Antarctic Centre. We truly believe that. And all these other experiences around Christchurch, whether it's out in Banks Peninsula, um, are all set up and, and we believe uh, yeah, an important part of telling the story and creating more advocates and ambassadors for our ocean and the protection of so thank you that's great thank you very much and i think it's important to remember antarctica and actually how close it is to christchurch i know the high school that i went to the houses were all named like wilson bowen scott shackleton you know showing that connection to antarctica